Welcome to the Cappuccino Club's social TV channel. An empowered woman is someone who knows the strengths and isn't afraid to embrace it. We invite you all to join, join us as we introduce you to women who lead in academia and research and inspire and empower others to change through conversations. Thank you for tuning in. Don't go away. We will be right back. Hello and welcome. Hello. If you are just joining us, I am your host, Bridgette Lambanda. I'm a live video camera confidence coach, and I host and produce live video shows that helps brands, entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and social good initiatives share their stories. I'm also very passionate about practicing responsible social media. Today, we introduce you to women who lead in academia. My co-host is an accomplished senior executive herself, Viola Manuel, and she's been nominated for multiple awards. Viola was the CEO of the Cape Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the executive director of the Cape IT Initiative, a member of the Western Cape Premier's Council of Skills, just to mention a few. Viola also serves as a non-executive at the National Sea Rescue Institute in South Africa, as well as being the deputy chair of the Cape Town Stadium. Viola has got two entrepreneurial ventures, GNV Retail and Afri Wellness, but she says she's most proud of her achievement of being a mom to a 10-year-old son, Shay. Viola set up the Cappuccino Club as a social platform to meet inspirational ladies like the ones we're meeting today who are at various stages of their lives. And today we're going to meet women who lead in academia and research. Viola, good morning and welcome to you. Thank you so much. And to all our viewers, thank you for tuning in and watching the show. Um, today's a very exciting day, uh, you know, for us at the Cappuccino Club, one of the main objectives is to expose women who are doing phenomenal things to other women and really just trying to create a support network for each other. It's fantastic for us to now have an opportunity to listen to the women who play a major role in academia. The interesting thing about the Cappuccino Club, of course, is that we try not to sort of showcase the usual suspects, you know, the people who are constantly in the press, but also just showcase some of the women who are doing groundbreaking work that are not always um, familiar to everybody and their names and their faces are not always familiar to everybody. So we really, really are excited about our guests today and the discussion that we'll have um, with women leading in the academic and research space. Oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Definitely looking forward to bringing these ladies um, online and having a conversation with them. So shall we welcome them to the show? Yes, let's do An empowered woman is someone who knows the strengths and isn't afraid to embrace it. We invite you to join us as we introduce you to women who lead in academia and research and inspire and empower others through conversations. Good morning and a very warm welcome to the show, ladies. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Could I ask each of you to introduce yourselves to our audience? Um, shall we start with Niziswa? Um, hello, everybody. My name is Niziswa Titi. I am a PhD scholar based at the South African Medical Research Council. Um, and the unit I work in is called the Directed by the Institute of Social and Health Sciences, which is based at the 
I am primarily responsible <coughs> for the coordination of the transdisciplinary African psychologists for the Colloquia series, um, which is about talking about decolonization and African centered research and scholarship. And I've been really <coughs> person of SISA's division of research and methodology. Thank you. Welcome and thank you for introducing yourself. Um, Lynn, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience, please? Sure, I'm Lynn Hendricks. I'm at the Center for Evidence-Based Healthcare. I'm a researcher here, also a PhD student. Um, so I'm registered at <coughs> KU Lofton Department of Social Science and here yeah, at Stellenbosch University in the Department of Global Health. I am an executive member of the Psychological Society of South Africa and do a bit of lecturing where I can for the last few years um, at the <coughs> university. Thank you for that um, introduction. Can we ask um, Michelle to introduce herself next? Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Michelle Andy Patton, and I'm an associate professor in the uh, Department of Psychology. Um, I've been in academia for the past 32 years, um, and currently I'm deputy um, head of department after having done a stint of four years um, as head of department um, within the university. Um, my areas of interest in research really is about women's health, particularly reproductive health and high-risk reproductive health, and also issues in gender and particularly um, gender-based violence. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for that introduction. Can we have Rizwana next? Could you please introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rizwana. And I'm a lecturer in the psychology department at the Stanford University. I lecture both undergraduate and postgraduate students, and I supervise several honors, <coughs> masters, and excellent. Welcome, ladies. Great to have you um, on the show. Can we ask each of you to start our conversation? Why do you think academia is such a unique space for women? Um, can any of us start? Yes, go for it. Okay, <laughs> sure. Um, being at, you'd, at in academia for 32 years, um, it wasn't always a case of this being a unique space for women. In fact, it was a very difficult space for women um, in those early days. Um, even today, I think the playing fields are not completely level, um, but I think we're reaching there more and more. But I think this is really a space where women, we can make our voices heard, we can contribute um, towards the knowledge economy. Um, but even more than that, I think we're in a very privileged position where we can assist in making an impact and forwarding an agenda of social justice. <clears throat> Rizwana, could we have your opinion next? Sure. Um, I think that not all academic spaces are the same. So it's hard. I, I don't want <clears throat> us to generalize or give a general impression about an academic space. Because even within universities and within departments, there are there's quite a few differences. <clears throat> so I'm going to speak a bit more personally. And I'd like to say that an academic space is a good space to be in because it really affords you many opportunities for growth. And I'm talking about academic growth, professional growth, um, as well as personal growth. I can see that there are sort of changes within the academic space. And, um, and I think that women are becoming more vocal about what we need. And I think that spaces are adjusting to that. So before this, the environment used to be quite male dominated and everyone was only focused on academic excellence. And I think that now people are, us as students are saying that we want to be treated as human. We'd like to work with people who are willing to help us grow who are willing to learn and, um, and I think that, that, that 
that academics are heeding the score and and are listening. And I think that the academic environment is adapting to this. So that's why I think it's a really good space to be in, not just for women, but for anyone. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, could we have the, the next? Yes, I agree with Michelle. It's not always been an easy space for women in academia. We've had to fight just as in other industries and in other areas to have spaces made. And I like how this one put it, that spaces are adjusting to accommodate women. Um, but it's a good space for us to be in. We are expressive in this space. And I think it really gives us an opportunity and a stage to on which we can um, express views of other women. You know, a lot of the research that's been done before has been about women by generally men. And now we do research about ourselves, with ourselves, with other women like ourselves. And I think there's definitely advantages to the space in that um, you don't need physical strength or anything like that. You just need to have your position and your views and the commitment to put it down onto paper and to share it with others. Fantastic. Could we have um, this one next, please? Um, hi. Um, the nurse said everything, but what I would like to add to what they're saying is that we, as um, women now, are in inserting our, ourselves, our voices, and ideas as well. We are not afraid in the more of stating the agendas. So, and that, that is what we are this, this business are with now. So, it is now a space where we set the agenda and we implement and we are implementing those tools. Thank you. I, I think that's I think that's amazing and it's very exciting. Um, one of the things that I'm hearing the ladies say is that it is really a time for women to start forging um, in this space. I loved what Lynn said. It's you know historically we've had men researching about women and then telling us how we feel and what we think, and now we suddenly have a band of very strong independent. Um, women who are able to sit down and say, actually, this is how we feel and this is what we think. And also the trust factor of getting some of the information out, of, you know, getting information from women, especially about things like reproductive health, um, social um, engagement, etc. Trying to get that from women, um, it may, it, you know, it sort of, in my mind, translates to a more transparent discussion when the person sitting opposite you is another woman. Um, but I think that's fantastic. That's really very, very interesting. Um, one of the questions I have is in terms of this whole space, it's a very unique space. Being in the academic space is a very unique space. Are there specific advantages for women um, being in that space? So one of the things I've um, started speaking to some of my friends about is the fact that there's a little more flexibility in the academic space around your time. Um, more flexibility, if, especially if you're a mom or if you are somebody who has additional responsibilities. This space allows you that flexibility. Is that true or is that just a, a myth that we've got to try and take care of today? Um, maybe let me ask Lynn, start with you. Sure. Um, so, yes, absolutely. This is one of the things I enjoy most about the academic space is the flexibility that I can plan my days, but let's not forget this is a job that carries on for 24 hours a day. It doesn't have a start time and an end time. We have deadlines and we've got multiple parallel deadlines that happen that are non-negotiable. How we manage our time around that deadlines are flexible, but it is a very um, time-consuming industry to be in. It does mean spending time away from families. So even though we have flexibility in our day-to-day -day schedules, it does involve lots of traveling, lots of conference attendance, teaching outside of your institution. So you do spend a considerable amount of time on the road or away from home. So we do then value having those mornings that you can share with families and having the weekends that you can block off some time in between things. So it has its pros and its cons, yeah. 
Thanks, Lynn. Michelle, what do you think about that? Michelle, the just add start again i'm sorry your yeah. mic wasn't me. sure i think the flexibility um is a huge advantage like you said particularly when you are a mom um you can and like what lynn is alluding to you can plan um but again um we mustn't lose sight of the fact that it's a very demanding um industry to work in um we are expected to publish all the time we expected to supervise we expected to teach um so when one weighs up, um, it's not an easy space to be in. Um, when one comes home, your family wants you to be with them. They demand your children, demand your time. And so sometimes it's very difficult when you're walking at home and you have to open up your laptop to start working again. Or if you get to bed, you get to, to bed quite late in the evenings because you, you're sitting up, you're up early in the morning. Um, but for me, the, the flexibility is quite important and it is an advantage. I think the other advantage for me really is about being able to contribute towards the creation of knowledge. That for me is very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the, um, this is one of those spaces where we can really say that we're contributing towards change, towards towards to to social transformation. Um, we contribute towards thought and thinking. Um, and that for me has always been important. And I think being the draw card for me within academia. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Uh, Naziswa? What I'm enjoying about that is that you can choose the, the, the people um, with, with, with whom you, you, you want to, 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 to work with. So the flexibility for me is that, that I, I am not forced to work with the same kinds of people each time. Yeah. So yeah. I can so I really can work with people at UNISA, can work with people from Stellenbosch, from societies in and other other um areas as well, like vids and nanas and and so 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 on. But all a lot of that is with 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 in time frame. So you know you manage all a lot of that um with 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 in the hours you you have, and those are not always in your work is the king hours. So you must. And, 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 and all of that. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Rizwana, what, what is your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts? So, um, Nazis was also speaking about the academic freedom, and this is a huge advantage because for us, we can decide which areas we'd like to research. So, if we have an interest in something, we can research it. And I mean, people in other jobs don't really have the opportunity to really pursue knowledge in an area that interests them. So this is a huge advantage. And I also hear what Lenny is saying about us working all the time. So we really never stop working. Um, we work after hours, often we work weekends. And, um, and so there's that disadvantage. But at the same time, I think that working in academia um, it really affords me an opportunity to to be a role model to my son at home, you know, to show him this is what women do. Um, mm. And I've taken him with me to conferences and um, he sees how I work at home. And, and, and I think children also learn by emulating what their parents do, not just when you tell them, go and do your homework. So I think in the private space also, when they see that you're working, it's beneficial to your family because they model that as well. Mm. That is that is so true. I'm on the same page with you. I have a beautiful boy um, named Shay. He's ten years old, and he, um, you know, I, one of my things is to raise him to understand strong women like the ones we're talking to today. Understand what what makes them tick. Understand that they are to be respected, um, and so on. So I think I think that's great. Thank you. That was so so insightful. Thank you very much. Um, so one of the, the more sensitive things, Pigetti, that I've been getting from my, my colleagues in, in academia, I don't know if you've heard about this as well, is this horrible thing called um, campus politics. Um, you know, you sometimes think that the politics only exists within the corporate space. But as I understand, the campus politics can be quite scathing um, and quite, quite, you know, you, it really leaves you battle scarred. Um, how do you, um, you know, especially as as women in the space, it's it's sad that very often in some of these spaces we represent our gender, 
you know, you sit at a boardroom and you're the only woman there. You unfortunately, whether you like it or not, you're representing a gender. Um, and as you would represent womanhood in the space, um, how do you how do you get around the sort of campus politics or the um, institutional politics that might want to drag you into it? Um, let's start I think Lisa. that's a very good question, um, Viola. It's you know, politics is everywhere. And unfortunately, the academic space is definitely not immune to politics. Lynn, can we go with you first? Lynn, do you want to just unmute your mic? I thought we were lip reading. <laughs> 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 um, I've had my fair share of campus politics and I must say where I am based right now at the center here in the Faculty of Medicine at Stellenbosch, I've had the least amount of campus politics. Um, we are woman-led, our department is woman-led, our division is woman-led. Um, we outnumber the uh, men in this unit by far. And um, the type of leadership we experience here is equal and equitable for everybody. We don't really have workplace politics here. Where I do find instances of politics um, in the larger university framework, I navigate that by reminding myself what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and who I am. Um, I always be cognizant of the goal which is to contribute to the knowledge. Um, I think Michelle also alluded to this earlier, and I have to remind myself who I am. So never um, sacrificing my values or my beliefs for the sake of politics, and um, also trying to make sure that I am a good example um, to other researchers that come after me or even the colleagues that I have around me. Brilliant. Can we ask Rizwana next, how do you navigate um, politics around your campus? Um, I think there's sort of two types of politics. So the one would be related to broader issues on campus. And, and I think in that space, so if you see some sort of injustice or you're worried about issues that are happening on campus and they're important to you, I think it's important to get your hands dirty and get involved and speak up. Um, the other type of politics is about personal politics. And I think that within an academic environment or within most environments, it actually stems from competition. And this can be a very natural response, especially if you're in um, an academic setting where most people are high achievers. And it's very natural for people to want to compete with one another. And so my advice is to not get sucked into it um, as Lynn said, it's important for you to be authentic and to always be aware of what your values are and stick to those values. So that self-awareness is really important, I think, within any working environment. And don't sort of, if, if something is against your values, just don't go there. Yeah, that's my advice. Good. Excellent. Very well balanced. Michelle, can we ask you next, please? So if I, as best as I can, I think it's a very loaded question. Um, if I unpack the word politics, um, I agree with Rizwana, there are different levels of politics. Um, we have the kind of institutional politics, and then we have what I would like to call the more personal dynamics, which I think, Viola, you were alluding to, and where things can become, become quite toxic. But coming from an institution like the University of the Western Cape, um, we come from a political background, and there's no way that one escapes those broader kinds of political struggles. And I think the 2015, 2016 hashtag fees must fall um, campaigns and the hashtag in rape campaigns um, kind of showed us again that we cannot escape it. So mm -hmm. I think one has to be aware um, of your social location and your social positioning all the time. So that at the end of the day, when one responds to these kinds of political dynamics um, that one comes from a position of consciousness and one comes from a position of awareness. And like Rizwana also alluded to that, when there are injustices, um, I don't think that one 
in this day and age should remain silent. How we respond becomes important because there are so many different platforms and so many ways. For example, we saw now with the gender-based violence campaigns within Cape Town, um, how powerful it is when we rally on a mass level. On a more kind of personal dynamic um, scale, it becomes quite tricky. Um, I think that uh, many people enact their personal dramas in a very unconscious way, that they're not aware even sometimes of how they're playing out particular dramas, whether it be through the lens of gender, whether it be through the, the lens of, of race, class, religion, whatever lens one chooses to, to view this through. I think that people sometimes are extremely unconscious in terms of their own stories and narratives and how this translates into the interactions with other people. And so when you are unaware and unconscious of these dynamics, they play themselves out in quite toxic kinds of ways. Mm. So to sum all of it up, I think one has to become very aware of who you are interpersonally, intrapersonally, as well as, as on a social um, kind of way that you're aware of your social location and your social position. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes, I absolutely want to say wow to that response. Um, Naziswa, can we ask you next? And before you before you, you speak, I just want to say a warm welcome to our live audience, both on Facebook and on LinkedIn. Um, if you have any questions for our panel, please do put them in the comments. We are watching the comments, both on Facebook and on LinkedIn. So thank you for joining us live. Naziswa, over to you. Wow, what will I say after all of this? My colleagues are just so articulate and very, very smart. How I deal with it is that I am always aware of why I am in a space. My vision is always I'm what 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 is guided and then so um and 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 I use um. A space to help me deal with things and I I am I'm, 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 I'm not happy about example um issues of race issues of of um I'm kinds of so I you I you um so I you use a space to do that I'm I'm happy I'm 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 in that space more than most maybe or maybe even in the um, uh, sort of corporate space it's it's really just understanding who you are what you stand for uh, why you are there what your vision is all those good things and then i um your social location your interpersonal skills understanding that because I think, um, you know, most spaces have politics, but for young ladies wanting to come into the space, ladies watching the show, um, even young gentlemen watching the show and saying, you know, the academic and research space is where I want to be. When they say that, um, you know, they have to, you have to understand that you have to be a very strong person who's certain of who they are because you're surrounded by very clever people, very articulate people. Um, people who are, 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 have a wealth of knowledge and very deep, um, you know, knowledge on the subject matters that they are experts in. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, now, um, I know there's a sort of unkind um, saying in education at the moment that says, you know, those who can do and those who can't um, do, you know, they just teach. And it says there that those who can't teach, teach others to teach, while those who can't teach others to teach either become education administrators or researchers. And I sent you that quote because, um, you know, just researching today's show, that's something that popped up for me. And um, I've got my own views on why I completely disagree with that. And I'm not even the, in the academic space. But I'd love to hear you all respond to that. Do, do people in... 
um, business, uh, you know, when you meet with them, do you feel that they take you seriously? Um, do they take your expertise seriously or do they just sort of rub it off as that's just a bunch of academics talking around the table who don't understand the real world and how it works? Um, maybe we we'll start with um, Rizwana on this one. Do you want to try and unmute your mic first, please? There we go. Thank Sorry. You. <laughs> I've heard this saying, um, maybe there's some truth to it, but I haven't encountered this sort of experience when working, um, when interacting with people in the business world. So I don't, um, you know, I'm not sure how, how this is really, um, how, how much truth there is to it and how much people listen to it. Um, but I think that for, for us in the academic space, people don't really understand what we do and how much we do. Um, and we do all of it. We do teaching, we do research, we do work sometimes with clients as well. I, I remember being a first year student and seeing my lecturers and thinking, oh, this looks like a really nice job. They teach for two hours a day and the rest of the time they have free. So they don't really do much. It seems like quite an easy gig. Um, and I can guarantee you that it's it's not true. And I think that researchers and, and academics, you wear various hats and you have um, engagements with society on multiple levels. So I don't think it is that you can't do. I think that maybe there's an element of being more reflexive in what we do. Um, and this sort of cognitive component is what, what people think about, that we're all just reading books and, and not doing much. But um, I think I can say with confidence that we can do as well. Okay, <laughs> I be I hear you. <laughs> okay, Lynn, do you want to go next? Before, sorry, Lynn, before we we get your comment, I just want to acknowledge a comment on LinkedIn okay. um, because I'm un unable to show the comments on LinkedIn on screen. I am showing the comments from Facebook on screen. So Tish um, is in the US, and she says. A lovely compliment to all your ladies. She says, this would be a lovely group to come to the US and speak. It would be phenomenal. So thank you for that comment, Tish. Great. Um, Lynn, do you want to go ahead and answer our, our, um, our um, discussion or contribute to our discussion around those who can and those who do? <laughs> I rebuke that statement. <laughs> <laughs> I have yet to see a reference for that statement. It's not valid. It's not viable. There's no evidence. It makes sense. If you look at what has been said and the alleged quote, if you think about those conducting the research now, they are creating new evidence. They are testing old evidence and they're finding out best practice. Without that, then this ecosystem doesn't work. There will be nothing to do based on good evidence and good practice. There will be nothing to teach. So I think everybody needs to, con we all contribute to this learning, teaching, doing ecosystem. We all play a part. The best teachers are the one that do because without the experience and without knowing what is out there in industry, it's impossible to teach and to keep up to date. That is why we've got systems like CPD. That is why we continuously train, attend short courses. We invest in working outside of the academic sector. It's what makes us good at what we do. I have yet to be exposed to a professor or a lecturer who has zero um, experience in the professional world. Okay. You know, we're forced to stay on board with what is happening. Um, the students, as they come through the years, and every year, year when we get a new cohort of students, they come with new skills, more advanced skills. And in order for us to effectively teach, we need to be up to date with what is happening all the time. Um, so I, I don't think there's much value in this statement. I think it's more about everyone has a role to play. And without everyone playing these roles, the system will break down and we won't have this teaching learning cycle that happens yeah we've just found our future minister for higher education um <laughs> yes, I will thank, you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you minister Ms. <laughs> um, <coughs> 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 
Do you want to unmute your microphone? It's, it's still muted, my dear. Can you try and unmute it? Yeah. There we go. Okay. So I agree with Lynn. Um, I agree with Rizwana. That is just, I, I was laughing actually. I read it and, and I laughed. But I want to talk about admin and, um, and research. Admin is so is so much da, 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 down played and it's so and it's so wrong because nothing can function without admin. Absolutely. Nothing can function without a person that can think and and plan things. So administration is at the core of a functional whatever it is, functional organization, functional company. So you, you need admin generation and so the searches are are in vault in that as well because you, you manage your yourself first, you manage your students, you manage your project and 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 everything else. That, that, that goes into do, 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 um, into do, do, that. So we do administration, we do management, we do supervision of students, we mm. do authorship, we do field work, we do groundwork, we do all of those things. So our work is is very much loaded. And with I mean, the research now, um, all our all our um, work it informs things like I mean it it informs as well so. Um, there is no, 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 nothing like we are to do, 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 and just be big, be big, because we, 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 um, we, 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 all of this in a deduction to everything else I'm giving, which we have to do, do, do mm -hmm. and must do. Yeah, so it's full. It's a full plate, full plate of stuff to do. Michelle, your thoughts? Just unmute your microphone, please, dear. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, I think um, I've experienced both sides of the coin that you that you spoke about right at the beginning, where people from the business corporate world would say, ah, they're academics, they live in their head. I think the landscape within academia shifted tremendously over the last five years. And I think many decades, two, three decades ago, um, there was this whole idea of academics sitting in the Ivy League universities, theorizing about the world out there without really having an understanding of real world social issues. But I think things have shifted so much that what we do is so implicitly integrated with what we do within the academy, that there isn't the split anymore between the real world in inverted commas and academia that we are embedded within the social contexts that we come from and so for those artificial splits and that those binary ways of thinking about the real world versus academia i think that has been broken down more and more and we we, we do see much more of an of an integration of of those particular aspects and like my colleagues alluded to um the academic space is a very complex one um and and if we go back to the to the marxist way of thinking for arguments like we marx would basically say that um you know we're all contributing towards this huge machinery and without one aspect of it the whole machine um, would collapse mm. so we, we we need to start breaking down hierarchies and thinking that one task is less than 
um, because without the one, the other one cannot function. So yeah. I agree with Lynn. I also rebuke that. I think it has no substance. It has no evidence, particularly within the era that we're finding ourselves within. And if, if just to go one step further, if we think about sustainable development and we think about globally where we find ourselves within, um, we have to pull together in some way so that yeah. we will be able to see this planet still up and running within the next 20, 30 years. Absolutely. Rizwana, do you want to add anything else? Yeah, uh, Michelle just reminds me now that one of the, our key performance areas is actually community interaction. So the university also appreciates that we need to be involved with communities that we work with and not just purely be academics and doing research and publishing and teaching, but have more involvement in, in communities and within civil society. Yeah. So, yeah. That's again, really, supporting what you're saying. That's very interesting. I think from what Zizwa was saying about the fact that there is no, I think when you look at academ academics, there are so many facets and so many roles that you all play that um, isn't really known by the sort of general public. Unless you're in that space, you won't know that. So um, thank you. I, I, I can understand why there was this rebuke of that statement. <laughs> I think it's probably one of those uh, <laughs> statement that nobody takes seriously anymore. Um, one of our, our listeners, um, as just um, uh, viewers, has just sent in a, an interesting question. I'm going to ask one mm. of you to comment on this, mm. and that is, what is the key role that women leaders can play in academia in terms of the fourth IR in higher education? So the fourth industrial revolution is a massive discussion. Um, and I know we're sort of getting to the end of our, of our show today, but I would like to ask one of you, whoever feels that that it's a pro, um, you know that they would like to answer that. How do you, as women leaders in academia, start um, dealing with the fourth IR in higher education? How what's that going to look like? Maybe Anybody? I can respond. Yeah, oh. maybe I can respond to that. Um, thank you, Dr. Phyllis, as one of my colleagues here at UWC. Um, I think um, women play a central role in ICT, in technology, um, and all of this translates into our learning and teaching activities. And we are required to become more innovative in our learning and teaching strategies, because if we understand the landscape of education, and I'm not just talking higher education, I'm talking education from schooling. We know that many of the students that we serve at UWC come from a deficit position, where our schooling system hasn't really prepared them for higher education. So our ways of learning and teaching become so important. And our students are not a homogenous group of students. So you'd find your students who are your top achievers and then your kind of middle uh, um, achievers. And then you find your students who really, really grapple. And we all don't learn through the same medium. Me, uh, media. For example, some people are visual learners, some people are auditory learners, some people are, uh, enjoy reading. And before academia was based purely on reading and our learning and teaching strategies were based on, on reading. And so we've, we've had to come to understand that we are dealing with a very diverse range of students. And so our learning and teaching strategies has to match those kinds of demands and those kinds of diverse demands. So I see that we have a very important role to play. Our ear always needs to be the ground. What are the needs of our students? And with our ICT platforms that we currently have, fortunately, we are able to respond to those kinds of demands within higher education. I've also just helped one of the students from um, the ICS, the Information Communication Systems Department, um, a woman who was finishing a PhD, and she had come to me to ask me to assist her with how do we understand ICT through a feminist lens. So more and more women are engaging in ICT and technology and, and with the fourth industrial revolution, it's becoming critical for all of us to engage um, at that particular level as well. Yeah, I, I mean, it's just, um, even with me, with Shay, he's now doing French. I don't speak a word of it. Um, <laughs> you know, just, um, Oh, at wee wee. Um, and so, you know, I'm just, you know, just having these different platforms 
that teach him or enhance his um, ex learning experience has become very important. I personally think that the future for um, people studying is going to be radically different. I think my, my personal view on this, and maybe we should take it offline, is that very soon you're going to be able to get one part of your degree from one university, the next part of your degree from another university, and the universities are going to have to play nicely to be able mm -hmm. to give me my qualification. Um, mm -hmm. I think very yeah. soon things are going to change. I, um, 15 years ago, did my MBA completely distance learning. I never saw a single professor. And it was incredibly mm -hmm. difficult, but I think it was important. So we really need to, as women, start really thinking about this and spearheading, the, and at least participating in these discussions, yeah. if not spearheading them. Yeah. I have I have one question about um, um, the academic space as well, and I know we're getting to the end of our show, but I do want to ask one of you to just comment on this. Um, there's a book called Black Academic Voices. I don't know if any of you heard about it, but it was yeah. massive launched up in Johannesburg and it says that um, this book illustrates how black academics experience the workplace it tackles issues around belonging and exclusion um, do you feel that there is um, if we just talk about exclusion and and um, belonging do you feel that there is um, a gender bias in the academic and research space are you feeling that um, that bias is disadvantaging you I know um, some of one of you might have a comment on that. I'm going to just ask one of you to comment on that just because of time. Lynn, do you want to go? Yeah, maybe. Yes. Yeah, I, I do feel that there are biases in the academic and the research space. As much as there's gender bias, I also think that there is still a racial bias that still happens in academia. And there is even bias in where our knowledge is produced and how it's produced and what's accepted as evidence. So we, in science, we are forced sometimes to stick to the normal ways of doing the research um, through interviews, through questionnaires, through surveys. And that, that might not be the best methods for us to actually get to people's experiences. And we need to start branching out and thinking larger than also, the theories that we apply to things are all historical colonial theories that we need to re-explore and investigate its applicability to our context. Mm. It's about coming up with ways of knowing and what can be known in a very um, contextual way. And I know Neziswa also works a lot around African-centered psychologies. And um, her work is great and amazing, the decolonial work that we are all engaging in. So the only way to break through these biases is to create our own um, ways of knowing and what can be known. Um, but the biases will be there for as long as we are not addressing them. Yeah. They're not just going to disappear. We have exactly. to take the lead in focusing on this and then also training those that are still coming to also um, engage in these perspectives and African ways of, yeah. of seeing yeah. psychology and science. Absolutely. Um, Rizwana, you wanted to add something, please do. Gender bias. Go ahead. Uh, I think that there is still uh, a gender bias within academic settings. When I started out um, this conversation, I said that the, the space is becoming more accommodating to women. And during our conversation, Lynn also mentioned that there are uh, quite a lot of women entering academia and in her unit, the, the women way outnumber the men. However, one of the issues is that while women are increasingly joining the space, the top positions in terms of management is still held by men. The top awards still go to men. So um, a few weeks ago, I went to the NRF awards um, where they were handing out the, the A ratings. And out of 21, uh, 21 people who received aid ratings, only two were women. So this yeah. demonstrates there's still quite a bit that needs to be done to give women top management spaces within the academic setting, because we still sort of hold the lower ranks. Yes. Michelle? Yeah, just quickly, um, I think a lot of um, what we're seeing depends, it's very, um, it's based on your, the institution where you're at. If I think of our university, our rector's male and the three DVCs are all female. So there's a lot of movement towards getting women into senior positions. Um, but I think 
if one looks at the South African context, I think a lot still needs to be done. If you read the white paper in science and technology, the 2019 white paper, it speaks to the landscape and how white, male and aged um, academics still are. And so the whole thrust from government side is to change, is to upskill, is to support your emerging scholars and particularly women and black women. Yeah, thank you so much, Michelle. We've um, sort of coming to the end of our discussion. Um, I know, Naziz, you probably also would like to comment on that, but we, we are running out of time. Uh, what I did want to ask you all to do is to possibly just it, as a closing question, if there's a young lady watching this and she feels that the academic space is her space, um, what would your advice be to her? We'll start with you, Nazizwa. You've, um, let's start with you. Please unmute your microphone. There we go. I would say to uh, to to an end and another one. Um, to do, do not allow anyone to tell you what you can do and can't do. Okay. So be sure of yourself first. Be sure of what you want and 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 do. And be 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 that was told that you can't work here because you are still da -da 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 ring or you are black, you're coming from um, um, other areas. So when you hear that, be aware first of what you want to do and want to do, 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 do be and move with people that, that are able to do, 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 see you as a person and as no, no, not a, 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 about a person that, that can that can or can't. So trust in yourself and in your world or goals. Absolutely, Lynn. Just unmute your microphone first, please. <laughs> Of course, stop playing this game. <laughs> I would really advise and encourage young women to walk confidently in the path they are navigating. Don't be afraid of walls that are put up. Don't be afraid of closed doors. Those are pivotal moments. They are redirecting you. Just be assured that you are still moving forward. Um, I did when I was younger have the set path and how I plan for things to go. I learned very quickly there's no such thing as a plan. It's just about navigating the journey that you are on. And when things turn you away or the opportunity closes, it's a pivoting moment to something else. And it's not exactly a closed door, it's just a redirection. So just keep moving forward and keep engaging um, with other women in the field. Okay. Uh, Iswana? Okay, go. so I'll be brief. And um, my advice is to go for it. It's an incredible amount of work, but it's also very fulfilling. So that would be my advice. Thank you so much. Michelle? Um, I think being the HOD for four years and deputy HOD, I've seen quite a few things. And for me, I think as with any mm. other profession, it's mm. a calling. It's a calling. It's not a job. And everybody is not cut out to be academics and everybody's not cut out to be clinicians and everybody's not cut out to be researchers. So listen to that voice in, inside. Find your passion. Find what you want to do. Find your purpose and find your destiny. Lovely, lovely. I am one of those people that was not cut out to be an <laughs> academic and researcher. I'm so lazy to write. <laughs> Um, I like <laughs> talking what I could do, but the marking and the writing, but no. <laughs> Ladies, thank you so much for being such an inspiration today. Thank you for joining us. I know that it was for some of you a new platform um, to participate in, um, but I want to thank all of you. Thank you for sharing the video with so many people and to all of our viewers. Thank you very much. Just that's from my side. I know we we'll want to um, close off, but thank you very, very much. Very welcome. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.
Yes, I absolutely want to agree. I want to say a huge big thank you to our audience on LinkedIn and our audience um, on Facebook. And uh, remember to do good stuff and let's keep inspiring each other one conversation at a time. This is also an open invitation to any of you watching the broadcast to join the Cappuccino Club on Facebook. It's facebook.com forward slash Cappuccino Club um on linkedin if you would like to join us there it's also the cappuccino club on linkedin so thank you everyone for watching and uh, hope that this conversation inspired you okay just one last comment for anybody who would like to join the Cap cappuccino club whatsapp group you can message me directly and i will um certainly add you to the group there's no kittens with steaming cups of coffee no fantastic good morning messages just any information that helps women grow women thank you very much for joining us today thank you thank you bye bye, -bye. bye. Thank you.